The sovereignty and Providence is important in Milwaukee because there are a lot of disparities within the community. There are a lot of issues that SDC tackles on a daily basis. I came here today because I was really excited about the work that SDC is doing and the fact that the summit was bringing together over 500 people, a great way for our team to network as well as learn lots of new information. You know, every time we have a summit on poverty, what we're trying to do is just plant a seed in someone's head that they walk away and think a little differently about what they're doing because it's going to take all of us and all of us do a little something different. We've been evolving for 60 years. We've been learning for 60 years. And we're still learning. I am here to introduce our keynote speaker and the fire is still fire, y'all. Yes, uh, thank you for joining us. I'm excited um, that as we wrap up this the summit today, um, but more excited about what is coming before you. Stacy Patton, PhD, is an award-winning author, journalist who writes about race, politics, pop culture, child welfare issues, diversity in media, and higher education. Um, so there are some HU people in the house, so I was told to say HU. <laughs> All right, okay, enough. A as long as one of y'all holler, I'm told it's okay. Uh, <laughs> and it's some Greeks in the audience. All right, represent, represent all of that. SDC. <laughs> Perpetually repping, y'all. As an adoptee, child abuse survivor, and former foster youth, Patton is a nationally recognized child advocate whose research focuses on the intersections of race and childhood. Um, there's some accountability in there for us, y'all. Um, she is the author of That Mean Old Yesterday, a memoir by Simon in, uh, published by Simon & Schuster, Spare the Kids, Why Whooping Children Won't Save America. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Stacy Patton. All right. Do your thing, Doc. <laughs> you got it. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and advocates for change, beautiful people, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to be your keynote speaker for the 2023, one of your keynote speakers, excuse me, for the 2023 Summit on Poverty. I'd like to begin with everybody repeating a very simple yet powerful sentence with me. Is everybody ready? Is everybody ready? Yes. Okay, I want y'all to say it like y'all are at a Pentecostal tent revival in the summer. I want you to reach deep from your soul to say this with me. Here we go. Childhood, Childhood is, about surviving is about surviving adults. adults. So I want y'all to hold on to that as you take this journey with me this morning. So my address uh, today is titled Spare the Kids. How Physical Punishment Perpetuates Cycles of tra uh, Trauma and Poverty. I am case number KC114343 from New Jersey's child welfare system. I was whooped as a child and I turned out fine. I turned out so fine, in fact, that I've committed the balance of my life trying to convince people to abandon this violent practice especially in marginalized communities, especially in black communities, which have endured so much pain and trauma for centuries. Listen to me closely here. It is my belief that hitting children is not love. It is not protection. It is not godly. It is not an effective civil rights strategy. It will not free our communities. 
Whooping a black child is the whitest thing you can do to destroy them, physically, emotionally, intellectually, and spiritually. Whooping children undermines the health, vitality, and future prospects of our communities. Hitting children is a poverty mindset. Hitting children is a form of structural racism. The practice is a product of a long heritage of beliefs perpetuated by white supremacist institutions and ideologies which impress upon adults that children require violent coercion to become well-behaved and civilized. Whoopings are a tool of colonial violence that's pushed onto colonized people to increase trauma and destabilize families and communities while indoctrinating the young into violent racial and class hierarchies of power and getting them to believe that the violence is natural, normal, for their own good and love. I want to show you a series of videos, uh, some of which I've produced, to uh, demonstrate my point. Now, some of these are gonna be, all of them actually are going to be difficult to watch. So if you need to step away, please do so. But I think we need to face these because this is a painful reality faced by many children today. You can begin with the first. For our kids to excel, we have to accept our responsibility to help them learn. That means putting away the Xbox, putting our kids to bed at a reasonable hour. It means attending those parent-teacher conferences and reading to our children and helping them with their homework. And by the way, it means we need to be there for our neighbors' sons and daughters. We need to go back to the time, back, back to the day when parents saw somebody, saw some kid fooling around. And it wasn't your child, but they'll whoop you anyway. Or at least they'll tell your parents. Their parents, though, you know. <laughs> Mom, I just filled my history class. <laughs> I'm whooping your ass. Man, why you get so excited to whoop me? I'm going with CPS. Well, shut your ass. <laughs> Mountain Dew's in the refrigerator. One is missing. Don't nobody know? Take y'all drawers off. Y'all both get ass whooping. Hey, baby, what you want to talk to your mama about? Hey, mom, I took $20 out your purse. So you want to steal? I done wrestled one, two bucks. Look at that. Okay. Money. Okay. Okay. Hey. Four boys, I'll move through the live, Sit the floor, the play behind just to show you the time.
What you doing? Nothing. You hungry? Yes, ma'am. All right, let's go. Let's get something to eat. Useless human being. I'm going to McDonald's. What do you want from there? Large cheeseburger meal fence and no ice, please. And, and that's it? That's it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah. Next video, please. Black people have been parenting legally, legally parenting their children for only 150 years. Now, if you factor in Jim Crow, it's only 50 years. Toya Graham was not a hero for uh, chasing down, cursing out, and assaulting her son on national television. Get the f over here! But I empathized with her fear. I understood why she needed to intervene in that moment. What I was disgusted by was the media circus created by us. We need you to be a mammy, that bridge between the interests of a white authority and your thug son. Black people hit their child 92 times in the eye, in the nuts, in the feet. That's where the real pop locking came from. I will fuck a kid up. Don't get mad at me. I'm just saying what you can't say. You feel the same goddamn way I feel. Wait. Why are you crying? I Okay, listen, listen. Swim cheese. If you check the latest statistics from the Department of Health and Human Services, last year alone, black women, black parents, put 375 children in their graves as a result of child abuse. A disproportionate number of the perpetrators are black women aged 40 and under. We need to deal with that reality. It was love, and I wanted to really show that he's not a gang. You know, we don't come from this. Tonight, the uncle of a slain teenager defends what he calls an act of love. The Terrytown teen made internet headlines after he was seen being disciplined by his uncle for claiming to be a gangster just last week. The young man was shot to death outside of his home. Toya Graham and legions of other black men and women are parenting their children under a racist system that is designed to distort and destroy and kill their kids. So what we have to st stop doing as black people is, you know, becoming co-conspirators and participants in the dehumanization process. I don't, I don't spank. I whoops. Yes, I, w I was whooped, therefore I shall whoop. How did we get here? I heard a lot of laughter in this room. But in these videos and memes like this that circulate on social media, we witness harrowing scenes of parents shaming and physically punishing their own children, all captured and shared on social media for the world to see. Children, innocent and vulnerable, cry out in pain as they're beaten with belts and extension cords. Shockingly, 
We also hear comedians making light of this brutality, joking about beating kids as if it were a laughing matter. We hear the nation's first black president normalize violence and suggest a return to a past where assaulting children in the streets was commonly accepted. Obama's suggestion contradicted his principles of progressive and positive change for our communities. As a leader who symbolized hope and change for many, his endorsement of a regressive disciplinary approach raises questions about the consistency of values and the need for evolving perspectives on child rearing in our communities. Now, some of you might be wondering, what do these distressing images have to do with the perpetuation of cycles of trauma and poverty in our communities? Well, let's put all those videos, all the jokes, all the memes alongside some data. This is the latest data on child fatalities for 2020. As you can see, particularly in African-American communities, we consistently have a much higher rate, a disproportionately higher rate of child fatalities in our communities than all other racial groups. These are the numbers prior to COVID. We still don't have a full picture of what COVID did in terms of child abuse uh, uh, rates and fatalities. That picture is still coming together. So I also decided to look at micro data within African American communities in terms of um, fatalities uh, per perpetrated by black men and women against children. So what the data shows us from 2015 to 2020, um, 3,146 black children were killed as a result of child maltreatment. A uh, higher number of boys than girls and black women are, uh, represent a higher number of those who are killing children in our communities. When I was a little girl, my black adoptive mother, who was middle class, we lived in a suburb, they were God-fearing religious people, she would always say to me, I whoop you so the white man won't. I whoop you because the white man hates you. I whoop you because the white man wants to kill you. So I'm seven, eight years old thinking, who is this white man that she keeps talking about? Was it Bob Barker from The Price is Right? Was it Ronald Reagan? Maybe Ronald Reagan. I didn't know who this elusive white man was that she kept talking about. All I knew was that my black adoptive mother who said she was hurting my body because she loved me and wanted to protect me was the only person that I felt like could probably kill me. So I hear this echo. It's echoed for generations in our communities. The fear is real. State-sanctioned violence is real. But we also have to traffic in the data. So during the Black Lives Matter movement, a number of journalistic outlets started creating these databases to track police killings of citizens. And so on these databases, you can disaggregate the number of victims um, by race and age. So I decided to pull out the numbers of black children who were killed between 2013 and 2018 by police. The total is 41. It was about 46 for white children, but their population numbers are bigger. And then I also, um, uh, chose to pull out the numbers of black children who were killed um, by their own parents from the annual child maltreatment reports. So ladies and gentlemen, the sentence goes like this, between 2013 and 2018, 41 black children were killed by police officers. During that same time period, 2,389 black children were killed by their own parents. I don't say this in a Fox News black on black crime, kind of way. Both are serious public health issues. Both require our attention, our urgent attention. But the reality is that black children are more at risk of being seriously injured or killed by their own parents than the police. And many of those parents who are in that 2,389 category, you can go to any district attorney's office, uh, CPS offices, and listen to the voices of parents. These are not sadistic monsters who are killing their children. Many of those, the majority of those fatalities were a result of parents who were frustrated, stressed out, had a bad day, lost their cool, hit the child the wrong way, and I'm not suggesting there's a right way to hit a child, and they ended up a fatality. 75% of substantiated cases of child abuse and fatalities are people who used corporal punishment 
Corporal punishment is the number one risk factor for child abuse and child abuse fatalities. I wish I had a dollar for every time someone told me that spanking is not hitting. I would be able to pay off my student loans. That's how often I hear it. But it is hitting and we have to look at it as a form of domestic violence. Amidst these numbers, we have increased calls to defund child welfare, which scares me. And I say this as a former foster child whose life was saved by the system. It's not perfect. It perpetuates cycles of trauma. It doesn't, it's not designed to free communities, to empower children. The child welfare system in this country is designed to produce children who emerge from the system broken enough to perpetuate more cycles of dysfunction so people stay paid. So we're seeing these calls to defund the police, defund uh, child welfare. So there's this myth that black people have a, a wholesale monopoly on hitting children. This is not true. If we look at the data across race and ethnicity, the majority of parents, with the exception of Asian, the Asian groups, which are kind of lumped in together, um, uh, endorse using corporal punishment. A lot of people say, oh, these kids today are out of control. It's because they made it a crime to discipline your children. This is not true. Every state in this country has a law that defines how you can appropriately strike a child's body. You can do it one way in Texas and get away with it, do it another way in Vermont or Wisconsin, and you might end up in prison. Uh, people are also floored to know that 18 states still allow corporal punishment in public schools. 18, Colorado just banned uh, corporal punishment over the summer. Every state with the exception of New Jersey and Iowa allows corporal punishment in uh, private and charter schools. The majority of parents, according to all the research shows, that you know, are um, endorsing hitting kids or, use, or using corporal punishment on their children. And many of people start hitting their children before the age of two. Across uh, age and gender, boys, uh, so we start to see spanking peak around age three, two, three years old, and that tracks with the fatalities. So across gender, across the life uh, cycle of childhood, boys are hit more uh, than girls. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics is just one of many professional organizations that have come out against spanking children. Even though, so a lot of people think there's a difference between spanking and abuse. If I don't leave a scar, a mark, an injury on my child, I've done no damage. But that's not how the brain works. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no difference between spanking a child and abusing a child. That's not how the brain works. A child's brain does not know the difference between uh, spanking that does not leave a mark uh, hitting that leaves a mark and sexual abuse. All three are toxic stress events that trigger the exact same biochemical responses in a child's body. All three cause wear and tear on the immune system. All three cause structural changes to the brain. The, I worked also with the uh, American Psychological Association as well. All these groups cite 50 years worth of research that has concluded that there is no good that comes from hitting children. It is not good for their development, uh, for their, for their uh, emotional well-being, and their physiological health. Spanking is an ACE. I'm sure some of you have heard of ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. It is the latest um, ACE to be added to the list. So there is a correlation between your ACE score based on childhood, early childhood experiences and health outcomes. Um, so I met a, a, a doctor from Harvard some years ago, Dr. Martin Teicher, who did brain scans on adults who received corporal punishment that did not uh, um, qualify, as, legally qualify as child abuse. So there no marks on the skin, it wasn't obsessive. Um, so maybe once or twice a month, these adults had received corporal punishment as uh, children. And he took brain scans, MRI scans of those adults and those who did not receive any kind of corporal punishment. And what he found was structural changes in the prefrontal cortex of the brain. This is the part of the brain you need for higher thinking, good reasoning, emotional regulation, making good decisions. And what he found was shrinkage in the gray matter area of this part 
of the brain. So when I interviewed him years ago, I said, you need to also do scans on those who were uh, um, uh, abused, those who ended up in the child welfare system. So he compared all three brains, those who got no corporal punishment, those who got spankings, and those who experienced uh, physical injury and ended up in the system. And what he found was the same exact structural changes in the brain of those who got mild spankings versus those who got uh, abused. So this is the study I was talking about. Um, so if we want our children to have high IQ, to have full cognition, to be able to think, to be able to, com to control their uh, emotions, to engage in good behavior, this is not a practice, so according to the science, that we want to continue doing. There are, um, uh, there's a big meta-analysis that was done some years ago by Dr. Elizabeth Gershoff, 75 studies over 50 years, different cultures, different countries, you know, almost 200,000 children, and all of these studies found that the same sort of results, that it sets spanking children, alter, alters brain development, and can lead to these other outcomes. And parents are not intending for these outcomes to happen when they're using this. They don't know. My adoptive mother didn't know. You know, I often will walk into communities and people are really hostile and defensive about this issue. They want to defend their parents. They want to defend their own parenting. And so I take them through this journey and share the science, share the data with these communities in ways that they can understand. And by the end of the journey, they're mad for a different reason. They're saying nobody ever told us. Because a lot of academics and policymakers and folks talk at you. They lecture at you. They assume that you're so wedded and so you know, uh, wedded to cultural myths and ideas and your own personal anecdotes that you're not open to science and data. Corporal punishment is a full body experience, full body experience, multi-organ, multi-system process. I was in New Orleans some time ago, and I was in a black church, and it was packed. And there was a mother in the audience who was not feeling what I had to say about this. And that's fine. Harriet Tubman said, you know, she could have freed more slaves if they only knew they were enslaved. So liberation is not for everybody. And so she raised her hand and she says, you know, I whooped my son on the butt. That's not child abuse. So I asked her to come to the podium and I had a huge screen up like this. And I showed her a posterior view of the backside. And I pointed and I said, Mama, what's underneath that? And she says, well, it's an ass. And so the whole audience starts to laugh. I said, yes, you're right, but what's underneath it? And she looked and she looked and she couldn't answer the question. So I turned to the audience. Can anybody tell me what's underneath this? Reverend, you're blessed with the gift of sight. Tell us what's underneath the flesh. Nobody could do it. So then I changed the view, this time posterior backside, skin extracted back. Look, mama, all those nerves connected to the spine, connected to the brain, connected to the genitals. And I zoomed in on something called the iliac artery, which is near the scrotum um, for, for the case of her son. I said, when you spank your son on the backside, it causes instant blood flow to that area. Some of that blood flow branches off to his genitals. The only time we see that kind of genital blood flow is during sexual arousal and there was an audible gasp from the audience. And she got real defensive and she says, I'm not trying to do that to my son, I know mama, but this is how the body works. And so I had to return that audience to their body to help them understand and put names to the brain parts, to the nervous system, to get all those black bodies to become embodied again. Because when you whoop a child, you make them disassociate from their bodies. Shut up or I'll give you something to cry about to gaslight yourself, to deny the pain, to deny the truth of your experience. And then you're told, you're socialized to rename it as love. But the body never lies. It will always keep the score. So there's some more, uh, all these slides will be available to y'all, by the way. So it's essential to clarify um, from the, the start that, you know, uh, physical punishment is not good for uh, um, our bodies, our health. We have uh, 1,500 studies that show that spanking is, in, is um, not effective. It's a form of toxic stress that can lead to these health 
these health outcomes that we see in our communities, brain alterations, elevated hormones, obesity, depression, all of those things. A lot of people say, I was whooping, I turned out fine, but how's your blood pressure? How's your heart? You have migraines? Are you easily triggered to anger? Right? Whooping children will not keep them out of prison. If whipping children was effective at keeping black people out of prisons, then why are we having national conversations about mass wow. incarceration? So we have to, if, if whipping children was a prerequisite for success, then our communities should be ruling this country. Wow. So we have to understand mass incarceration for what it is, it's racist capitalism. And when we whip our children, we prime them. We make them vulnerable. We put them at risk for these traps. And so we need to start talking about the history of the rise of the carceral state after slavery in this country and what it is. And how uh, using these coercive practices is encouraged in, in our communities. It's been encouraged uh, since uh, slavery. Some people say, we bought whooping children over from Africa. There's absolutely zero evidence of this. The majority of those Africans who ended up on slave ships were young people. They hadn't finished childhood. They hadn't yet parented, right? They came from different cultures, spoke different languages. They didn't come over here with a universal parenting guide that says when your child acts up, grab a switch, and then quote the Bible that you can't even read because you don't speak English. juvenile justice incarceration rates in this country, the highest in the so-called developed world. This tracks also with adult incarceration rates. The foster care to prison pipeline, we don't talk too much about the foster care to prison pipeline and crossover youth. When you whoop your child, you put them at risk for this. Black children are more likely to be placed into foster care than white children are. And when they are placed in, they stay longer, they're at risk of being given psychotropic medications. Their educational outcomes also become um, at risk. Uh, this is a um, infographic that I put together to give you a sense of what both pipelines look like. So we have to start connecting this child rearing practice to these other systemic forms of oppression and how we inadvertently assist in this process. I told you about corporal punishment in public schools. This is a paddle from a school in Mississippi called Mr. Feelgood. They have children making their own paddles to be beaten with in states primarily in the South. So 200,000 children each year experience corporal punishment. There are immunity clauses in districts where if a teacher or a principal injures a child while in the process of hitting them, they can't be prosecuted. Now schools are supposed to be safe places. Schools are supposed to be places where you foster good communication and critical thinking and problem solving. Teachers and principals are supposed to be mandated reporters when there's suspicions of child abuse, but they're putting paddles in the hands of educators. And the kids who are disproportionately impacted by this mostly are black children and children also with developmental disabilities. These are the states we gotta take Colorado off of there um, where corporal punishment in schools are is still allowed. Mississippi is the top paddling state. I don't know if y'all could see it, but there's two maps at the bottom. The first map shows the top 10 paddling states in the country, with Mississippi at the top. The bottom map shows the top 10 lynching states. So you can pretty much overlay them. So you have one type of racial, racialized violence and coercion being replaced by another. And when we look at our outcomes, and the parents sign opt-in forms to say, you know what, I gotta work. I can't come up to the school and deal with this. So just take them in the closet, take them to the office, and beat them. And so we see that in these states, that corporal punishment in schools is often the first step in the school to prison pipeline. And the graduation rates reflect that. The suspension and expulsion rates are also connected uh, with with uh, these districts that use this type of punishment. 
So it's essential to clarify from the outset that physical punishment, I want y'all walking away from here, putting words in my mouth and saying that physical punishment is the sole cause of poverty in our communities. Structural racism and capitalism undoubtedly play roles in shaping our society's economic landscape. So we need to look at how, look at the impact of spanking, popping, beating, whooping, and, uh, and whatever semantics you want to use, uh, and what, how it plays out in sort of reifying these systemic inequalities. This, is, this behavior is not uniform across all, country, all, all communities, but it disproportionately affects marginalized communities, exacerbating existing disparities. So when you think about health disparities, health disparities in our outcomes, right? And we saw this uh, break open, especially during COVID. So when you are in traumatized communities where there's food deserts, where there's uh, racist policing, where there's crime, um, and you know our bodies, and our bodies go through a kind of weathering and toxic stress. We don't get enough time to breathe, to heal, to have our bodies restore. And so when we whip our kids, we add to that toxic stress. We have our kids walking around, their bodies full of these neural, um, you know, chemical surges like cortisol, uh, you know, oxytocin, and so forth that keep them on high alert, that affect their behaviors, that impact the way they're able to learn. It is connected to how they eat. So we have kids who will eat to self-soothe, eating dead food from these communities. It's all very mutually re reinforcing. So our former black president's suggestion for a return to that time where somebody could grab you and whoop you and send you back home to be whooped again can unintentionally perpetuate systemic inequalities. And this was coming from a man who was raised by his white grandparents in Hawaii and Indonesia. He doesn't know anything about that trope. So he invoked it in the front of this all black audience at the NAACP's 100th anniversary to authenticate his blackness. His own wife said, you know, we hit our oldest daughter once, but we found out it didn't work. So he told black Americans right, on the heels of everything that was going on, that this is what we need to do. We need to have a broader conversation on evolving parenting practices. It's time that we honestly acknowledge the detrimental impact of domestic violence on children and promote more humane and effective approaches to discipline in our communities. Now, I don't know about y'all, even though I heard a lot of laughter, but when I watched the videos that I showed you, I see parenting practices that inadvertently replicate scenes reminiscent of the painful era of slavery. My adoptive mother's living room felt like I was on a plantation. I could still feel the thorns from those switches. I could smell the sweetness of the branches. I could still feel the sting of those welts on my skin. All these years later, I walk around with extension cord marks on my face a fleshy braille that tells the narrative of all that pain. When children come into the world, they have no logic. The first 1,000 days of life are absolutely crucial. They have no understanding of history, no understanding of racism, patriarchy, ideology. All they know is the history of their own brain. Am I being fed? Am I being changed when I'm wet? Do they respond when I cry? Am I being held? All of this happens within the first 1,000 days of life. And the brain has to say, yep, these people respond to you. You can, you can form a, a secure attachment with these folks. But evolution says a child is going to attach either way, whether the parent is nurturing or neglectful or abusive. Because the brain's job is to keep us safe. It's an organ of social adaptation. It adapts to its environment. So if a child is beginning life in a chaotic environment with a lot of yelling and hitting and threatening, that's going to shape the way the child's brain develops, how its neurons fire off, right? It's going to say, develop this part of your brain so you can be hypervigilant and safe and defend yourself, or you know what? You can take in language. You can learn. You can learn empathy. You can learn problem solving. And all of this happens in the first 1,000 days of life before children learn to speak, before they develop cognition, memory recall, and also moral development. 
So before children even grasp the complexities of structural racism and economic inequality, their minds, their young minds are molded by their early experiences with their parents and caretakers. The bonds formed in these formative years are the foundation upon which they build their understanding of themselves and the understanding of the world. So what happens when the foundation is cracked, when it's built on fear and violence rather than communication and love and trust and empathy and compassion? This, ladies and gentlemen, is the connection between childhood trauma and is where the connection between childhood trauma and the perpetuation of poverty becomes evident. So we can talk about all these larger systems and structures, but it means nothing until we start looking at the treatment of children. This is the foundation of it all. Childhood trauma, often inflicted through physical punishment, disrupts healthy emotional development. The pain and fear inflicted on these innocent souls don't simply vanish with time. They leave lasting scars on their minds and their hearts, on their cognition. And what's the consequence? A generation of children carrying the weight of unresolved trauma into adulthood. It becomes a biological transfer that lives in our bodies and may not show up until you're having that stroke or that heart attack. As these traumatized children grow, they face a harsh reality. They may struggle with mental health issues, reduced self-esteem, and difficulty forming meaningful relationships. These challenges can impede their educational attainment and hinder their pursuit of stable, well-paying jobs. But the story doesn't end there. Traumatized children may also be more prone to engage in risky behaviors such as sexual substance abuse or criminal activities or risky sexual behaviors as they search for outlets to cope with their pain. I can't tell you how many parents I've talked to who whip their black girls for twerking. And I'm like, why are you doing that? We have been twerking through the diaspora for a millennia. This is distinctly African. That is an ancestor rising up in your little girl's body. It is our experience in this culture that has demonized our natural ways of being and celebrating our bodies that has us thinking that this is deviant behavior. How many of y'all got hit for rolling your eyes or sucking your teeth at your parents? Y'all ever watch an African film? All you hear is eh, rolling the eyes. That's African. That's the way we communicate. But under slavery, it was interpreted as you being indignant, challenging authority. So once again, this is transferred into our parenting practice as disrespect. And some of these mothers, I'll ask, so how old were you? Because they beat their daughters for being fast. How, how old was your child when you started hitting her? Uh, I started popping her when she was around two. There's this chemical called oxytocin, the love hormone. It happens when you breastfeed a child, when you kiss somebody. It's a, it's a good thing. It makes you feel good. But it also gets triggered in girls when they're experiencing toxic stress. There's a scientist who took swabs of saliva and urine from girls and measured those who had experienced corporal punishment versus those who had not. And he found elevated levels of oxytocin in the girls' um, you know, system who were being beaten. And why is this important? Because when a girl has too much oxytocin surging in her body early on, she begins to develop much quicker than you know, to experience precocious puberty. Right? Because this is just what biology is. So if you take any organism, a plant, an animal, a child, and you stress it out, you put it in a, a, toxful, a toxic environment, the brain receives the message, hurry up and develop so you can procreate because you might not survive all of this violence and stress to do it later. Whooping children can lead children to engage in relationships that perpetuate abusive patterns. There's such cognitive dissonance. Why is my daughter in a relationship with a man who beats him? Well, you, when she was a, a child, you and your husband or the father said, this is love. 
So you set the template very early on. It can lead to entanglement with the criminal justice system, limiting their future opportunities and perpetuating cycles of poverty. Yes, the most heartbreaking aspect is that children, before they even have a chance to understand the systemic logics of poverty and racism, are already set on a trajectory that makes it far more challenging to break free from its grasp. And it starts in the first 1,000 days of life. Childhood trauma can prevent young people from becoming adults who can break cycles of poverty through a variety of interconnected me mechanisms. So mental health impacts, so childhood trauma leads to mental health issues such as anxiety, depression, post-traumatic disorder. These conditions can hinder a young person's ability to focus, make sound decisions, and pursue education or employment opportunities effectively. I even see it in college classrooms, the kids who, you know, at Howard and at Morgan State where I've taught. Disrupted education. These kids may grow up to struggle with memory, emotional regulation, making it challenging to excel academically. This can result in lower educational attainment, limiting their access to well-paying jobs and economic stability. Interpersonal challenges. So they have difficulties in forming healthy relationships with people, impaired social skills, and trust issues may hinder young people from building supportive networks that could help them break free from poverty. Limited resilience. Trauma can, enroll, trauma can erode a person's resilience, making it harder to bounce back from setbacks and adversity. And I, I side-eye resilience sometimes, because I hear it a lot at conferences. Children don't need to be more resilient. You need to change the system so they don't have to develop resilience, so they have to keep adapting to structural racism and the violence of poverty. It says to adults that we don't have to do the work to make the path easier for these kids. Also, a cycle of repetition. So without intervention, young people who experience trauma may unconsciously repeat patterns of abuse and dysfunction in their own families, perpetuating the cycle of trauma and poverty to the next generation. And ladies and gentlemen, the research shows us that trauma can become biologically embedded. It will stay in our bodies. Trauma can become biologically embedded through epigenetic changes, altering gene expression in a way that affects your stress response systems, making you more susceptible to anxiety, depression, and other physiological health outcomes. So we see this, one of my favorite memes, a few of my favorite memes that articulate this. When a woman is pregnant, three people share that pregnancy. The woman, the child that's developing in utero, and that child's offspring as a cell. So if a woman is in a toxic environment, if she's stressed out while she's pregnant, all of that stress gets under her skin, breaches the placenta, and gets into washing, all those chemicals wash over the developing child. And so we have babies who come out dysregulated, hard to soothe. A lot of that has to do with the mother's experiences while she was pregnant, but also some epigenetic stuff that she inherited from her mama, from her grandmama, right? So if you have people, women, who are experiencing toxic stress during pregnancy or other kinds of trauma, that mother subconsciously passes on certain adaptations to her offspring and to her grandchild. So apply that logic to slavery. You got hundreds of years of women in this country, black women in this country, who experienced the horrors of slavery, generation after generation after generation. Then we had Jim Crow. So it wasn't like after slavery ended, there were a bunch of psychiatrists standing on the edges of plantations saying, come, let's talk about that rape. Let's talk about the breakup of your family and the impact. We've never had a chance in this country to breathe, to restore, to heal. So we've been carrying all of these generational traumas within our bodies. The behavioral and coping mechanisms learned by individuals who experience trauma may also be passed down intergenerationally, perpetuating cycles of trauma and its effects on future generations. 
childhood trauma can have lasting physical health effects, leading to chronic conditions that may require costly medical care for our families, our communities, our whole system. Physical punishment of children contributes to wear and tear on the immune system. It causes weathering and an accumulation of toxic stress in the body. And that too exacerbates racial disparities in our health outcomes. Economic barriers. Traumatized young people may lack the skills, confidence, and emotional stability necessary to seek and maintain stable employment, making it difficult to escape poverty. Lack of access to support. Some who experience childhood trauma may struggle to seek help or support due to stigma or trust issues, depriving them of valuable resources that can assist their journey out of poverty. Ladies and gentlemen, childhood trauma can have pervasive and long-lasting effects on a young person's mental, emotional, social well-being, creating significant barriers to breaking cycles of poverty. Addressing childhood trauma through therapy, we need therapy, y'all. It's not a white thing, right? And maybe Western therapy isn't the model for us. Maybe we need to go back to our indigenous, some of our indigenous ways of healing. Healing, so I was happy to hear the young lady up here talking about healing circles, right? We need support, we need community resources. This is crucial to providing young people with the tools they need to overcome past experiences and pursue a path towards a more prosperous future. So while we recognize that structural racism and capital, capitalism are formidable forces that contributed to poverty in our communities, we must also acknowledge the role of early childhood experiences. It's these experiences that shape the minds of young people that must one day confront these systemic barriers. In a pursuit of a more equitable society, we cannot afford to overlook the de devastating effects of childhood trauma and provide children with the love, support, and guidance they need to thrive. So I showed y'all some, I started this talk and I'm gonna close here with a different perspective, a different way of being and kinship with a child. So the videos y'all watched earlier were pretty disturbing, but there's a movement that's happening. It's called gentle parenting. So a lot of people make fun of gentle parenting. They call it white, but actually gentle parenting has been around for a millennia in indigenous cultures around the world. People make this mistake of believing that hitting children has existed forever it's in, across geographies, across time. It's not true. This ritualistic violence was born in Europe. It's been documented. A whole bunch of white male historians have written it before I was born. Because you know, when black women say these things, people don't believe us. So there's a whole bibliography I can email you if you'd like. Right? So this practice begins in Europe and, and you know, Europeans were destroying their own children for thousands of years. It, they didn't recognize that children were biologically distinct from adults until around the 16th century. Meanwhile, people, black and brown people around the world held their children in different regard. They called them gods. They were mystical. They were magical. Babatunde, father has returned. Yetatunde, mother has returned. You wouldn't strike a child because you could drive their spirit guides away. They were returned ancestors. You wouldn't smack your returned great-grandmother around the living room, tell her to go get a switch. What was that, right? And then we have to interrogate religion. Like our churches need to evolve uh, their theology around this. I will give somebody in this room right now, y'all got Zelle, Cash App, What's the other one? Venmo? PayPal? I will give someone $1,000 right now if you can find this sentence for me in the Bible. This sentence. Spare the rod, spoil the child. I'll wait. I can't really see the lights are a little blinding up here, but I'm waiting for a hand to go up. Any hands? Any takers? It's not there. Right? The rod is about wisdom, Guidance and protection. That's the Hebrew interpretation of rod. You can't be a follower of Jesus Christ and hit children. Come on here. Wow. Come on here. Why? Because Jesus coddled children. He never said, suffer the little children, come unto, unto me for a good butt whooping. 
never said that. He loved children. He said, to enter my father's kingdom, you must be more like a child. And not to mention, I know this may upset some people in the room, but Christianity is not our natural religion. None of those Africans who ended up on slave ships were Christians. They were either Muslims, they were worshiping Orishas, my God, female yeah. goddesses? Ooh, yeah. the dark continent. Yeah. Right? They didn't even speak English when they got here. It took over a century for us to learn English. It was illegal for us to read and write, so we weren't reading the King James Version. We didn't learn Christianity from North Africans, from the Egyptians, the Nubians, the Ethiopians. The Christianity that we got was forged through the enslavement process. And here we are quoting a scripture that's not even, even people don't, that don't go to church love to quote that scripture. Spare the rod, spoil the child. It actually comes from a 17th century poem called Hudibras. This is the first time that sentence ever emerges. And it is a poem about two lovers. Before they have sex, the female lover requires her male lover to flog her. That's where that sentence comes from. And we're using it to justify hitting children not there. So we need to get back to our indigenous ways of being uh, with our children. I'm not saying don't practice Christianity. I hang out in ch black churches all the time, and I'm not a Christian. I love me some gospel music. Take me to the king. <laughs> I can't sing, y'all. But, you know, I love the music because it restores my sense of humanity when I'm doing dark research. There's so much potential in our churches to have us uh, heal and create safe sanctuaries for children, to do child development courses in those classes. But we have to interrogate how we came to this religion, and we must purge some of the toxic elements out. How many of y'all know this man? W.E.B. Du Bois. So I want to close by leaving you with his words. My fellow advocates for change, all the beautiful people in this room, I'd like to close by inviting you to reflect on these prophetic words of the great civil rights leader and child advocate, W.E.B. Du Bois, who was one of the most influential thinkers of the 20th century. He said, in the treatment of the child, the world foreshadows its own future and fate. All words and all thinking lead to the child to that vast immortality and wide sweep of infinite possibility which the child represents. So beautiful people, what does this mean? This quote underscores the profound truth that the way we nurture and safeguard the minds and bodies of our children today shapes not only their future, but also the destiny of our world. We often hear people say children are the future. They are our right now. As we contemplate the challenges before us, from climate change, about 8,000 people died in Libya from a flood. Over 3,000 in Morocco, right? Climate change is real. So from climate change to racial and ec economic inequality, let us remember that is these, it is these very children who hold the keys to innovative solutions, compassionate leadership, and transformative change. We must reject the notion that beating and breaking children is an effective civil rights strategy that will keep children safe, disrupt the prison industrial complex, and lead to liberation. If whooping children was so effective, then we would be at a different place in our communities. Hitting children serves no other purpose other than perpetuating cycles of pain, trauma, and poverty. Instead, we must embrace our duty to protect and empower the next generation, for they are the architects of a brighter and more equitable future. By investing in our children's well-being, by practicing gentle parenting, conscious parenting, mindfulness, and healing from trauma, we invest in the promise of healthier families, reimagine educational systems, and the rise of a generation poised to address the world's most pressing issues. Their boundless potential offers a path toward healing, justice, and prosperity. So as we stand at this pivotal moment in history, let us unite in our resolve to guide, nurture, and inspire our children, for in them lies the embodiment 
of that limitless possibility that Du Bois talks about. Together we can build a society where the dreams of our children become the reality of our world, where resilience triumphs over despair, equity replaces inequality, and where the boundless imaginations illuminate the way to a better and more prosperous future for all. The fate of our communities and the destiny of our society depend on our actions today. So let's heed the wisdom of Du Bois's message and embark on a collective journey towards a world where the potential of every child is realized and where hope, justice, and infinite possibility flourish. So I want to leave you with this last powerful reflection. As we navigate the complex terrain of childhood, we must always remember that childhood is about surviving adults. Say it with me, childhood. Oh, that is so weak, y'all. Let's try it again. Childhood is about surviving adults. The question, ladies and gentlemen, we must ask is this. Do we want to be adults that children merely survive? Or do we aspire to become adults who nurture, protect, and empower them to thrive and shape a world that's safer, more just, and filled with boundless opportunities? The choice is ours. And it is our choice that carries profound implications for our children and the future they will inherit. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness, my goodness, my goodness. I'm just, you know what, listen y'all, I told y'all, some of this is gonna hurt. And I didn't, well, I wasn't talking about hurting other people. I mean, it's, it's, it hurts for us to be indicted as practitioners. And we all have said, I mean, you know, I think it's really trauma, the fact that we laughed at some of the comedy that we put in place around having gotten whooped, you know? And we have all said, I got whooped and I think I turned out all right. But did you? No. You know, but did you? Reconsidering what we know now, but did we? And then I'm gonna just throw this out here, Kia boys. That's all I'm gonna say. Think about it, apply, when you learn better, you apply what you learn, but then you do better. And we have to deploy a different measure of compassion when we are speaking about our children in the way that we do. Knowing what you, we all know about what's been endured. Something for you to consider.